Welcome. My name is Stephanie Fassler, and I am the Vice President of Operations and International Affairs Director of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. On behalf of the Council, I welcome you to this Foreign Policy Panel event, The Future of NATO and European Relations Under the Trump Administration. Many thanks to our strategic partners at the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center for their wonderful hospitality and the provision of this beautiful venue to hold our public programs. These events are filmed for our YouTube channel and are distributed via Facebook, Twitter, and other digital platforms. This video of the event will be made available within 24 hours. It is now my pleasure to introduce Chair of our International Affairs Committee, U.S. Retired Ambassador Laura Kennedy, who will introduce our panel. Well, thank you and good evening uh, tonight. Um, it's um, uh, almost 70 years since NATO was created in 1949. Uh, and uh, I like to think of it as uh, uh, the world's most successful uh, defensive alliance, but uh, we may have other opinions here tonight. Uh, we'll see. Um, uh, but um, uh, I think it's always worth uh, remembering that it, of, of NATO's, you know, Article 5 defense commitment. It was invoked for the first time when NATO came to the defense of the United States right after uh, September 11th. And, of course, in its almost 70 years, has had numerous other engagements, whether military or protective or whatever. And also, I think, has been uh, in some ways a, a great force for uh, uh, democracy as well as purely military uh, matters. But certainly, I think we all know that uh, over the last year or so, NATO has been particularly in the news, and not just because of, uh, uh, say, threats from Russia or something, but emanating indeed from Washington, uh, where our now president has been very critical of um, uh, what is often incorrectly referred to as dues to NATO, whereas actually, of course, uh, what the commitment was, uh, was over 10 years up to, I think, 2024, uh, to commit 2% of your um, uh, budget to uh, NATO. Anyhow, these are some many of the issues we can talk about uh, tonight, although um, given that NATO is indeed a nuclear alliance, frankly, um, I, I will put in um, a pitch for, I hope, one of the panelists might talk about how, for example, the decision, the action of the president today uh, withdrawing from the Iran uh, nuclear deal might affect NATO, given that, uh, of course, uh, three of the partners who negotiated this are fellow NATO members. Um, all right, let me turn to our all-star panel tonight. Uh, they all have in common the fact that they have uh, worked in the diplomatic field and then uh, pivoted uh, at one point to the think tank world. Although, um, in our uh, moderator's case, Ambassador Andras Shimonyi, he has just left the, uh, the Transatlantic uh, Center, I think, at uh, Johns Hopkins and moved to GW. Um, so. I got that right. Um, uh, anyhow, uh, it's a particular pleasure for me as an ex-diplomat to uh, introduce this great panel. Uh, Sandy Verschbau, uh, starting at the end, is one of the most eminent diplomats of his uh, generation. I was just thinking, what with the Caps win, um, I will say that, that uh, Sandy uh, achieved the very rare trifecta of a triple ambassadorship uh, to not only uh, Russia, NATO, uh, and also South Korea. He is now at the um, Atlantic Council. Uh, next is Nina Yankowitz, who started off at the National Democratic uh, Institute. And unlike the other colleagues, she actually worked for uh, um, in a diplomatic institution that was not her own country's, although she was sent as a Clinton Fulbright Fellow to Ukraine, where she worked in the Ukrainian Ministry of Foreign Relations on Strategic uh, Communications. Uh, and she is now at the Kennan Institute of uh, the Wilson Center and is working on a book in her specialty. Uh, Heather um, is... Uh, 
uh, started off at the State Department um, in our political military bureau, uh, bureau uh, uh, did many other things, came back as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for four years, including, I think, the year in which in NATO, NATO enlarged by with seven new members in 2004. Um, we were colleagues at that point in our European Bureau, and although many of us would often be relegated to what we called the couch of shame when our countries did something wrong, um, Heather, on the other hand, uh, was often one that was able to celebrate what was going right in her portfolio, which was Eastern Europe and, and uh, Northern uh, Europe, and she came up with the phrase of double touchdown for when something was going uh, right. I think we're going to have a, a, a quadruple touchdown tonight with this panel. Um, and Heather is now at CSIS. Our moderator, Ambassador Andra Shimonyi, uh, was uh, a diplomat uh, for Hungary. Uh, in, in his assignments included ambassador to NATO, ambassador to the US. Uh, now, one last thing I was going to say that unites this panel is that um, uh, they're musical, um, and uh, uh, I think it must have been when you were in Brussels as your as NATO ambassadors, Ambassador Shimoni and uh, Ambassador Verschbau uh, started a band that came to be known the Coalition of the Willing. Um, Ambassador Shimoni was on the guitar. San, uh, Ambassador Verschbau was on drums. Now, and, and Nina, when she was in Ukraine, I know, because I'd see the recordings, um, played the guitar in many a club in Kiev. Um, and as they say, music is the ultimate form of soft power. Um, Heather, on the other hand, says that she played the clarinet in high school. So um, again, <laughs> without further ado, let me uh, let this panel make beautiful music for you. <laughs> Ambassador Kennedy, thank you very much. This this was beautiful. Um, you might want to Google the fact that Sandy and I played uh, an almost full concert with Tommy Ramone once. We played Blitzkrieg Bop. <laughs> Sandy, that was, I think, that was a highlight, right? That was fantastic. Unforgettable. <laughs> Half the audience does not know who Tommy Ramone is. Oh. <laughs> oh, boy. This is not good. All right. Well, first of all, thank you very much. And, and I'm really honored to be here. And I'm mostly honored to be with, with, with some of my best friends in, in town. Um, let me start with a little story, <clears throat> because I think it's rele relevant to our topic today. 26 years ago, as a young Hungarian diplomat, the first Hungarian diplomat ever to serve uh, with NATO, um, I'm sitting in my office and I got a my secretary runs into the room and says, oh, the deputy chief of mission of the U.S. Embassy is calling. And that was a big deal. <laughs> Trust me, that was a big deal. And it's Minister Verschbau calling, and uh, he, he put a very simple question, uh, like holding a gun to my head. Uh, he asked, do you think the Hungarian government would agree to allow the AVAX planes to fly over Hungarian airspace monitoring uh, the no-fly zone in, in Bosnia? And I think it took me about 24 hours to come back and say yes, and that started it all. And then a few years later, and later uh, Sandy and I were sitting at the NATO Council uh, fighting a war in, in Kosovo. So we, we go back a long time. But Sandy, I, l let me start with you, because <clears throat> um, I really want to you know, have your take on this. Uh, the title of uh, uh, the event tonight is, is NATO and uh, in the air of, of, of Trump. Um, how, is Trump. How is the Trump administration doing? in regards to NATO, which I think you and I both consider the institution of choice in the transatlantic mm -hmm. relationship still. Yeah. Well, I like to say, and here it's another musical uh, reference, oh. I don't know if anybody heard this famous quote from Mark Twain about the music of Wagner. And he said, Wagner's music is better than it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, I think, is apt in describing the uh, Trump administra administration policy on NATO. I mean, the president came in saying that NATO was obsolete, and he was obsessed with the uh, lack of defense spending by most of the allies. He, he, I mean, basically, he's viewed our allies, our traditional trading partners, as a bunch of freeloaders who've been taken 
advantage of the United States. Uh, so uh, the omens were not good, but in practice, the policy pursued by his administration, and even you know, the president has uttered the right, the right words most of the time, uh, has been quite consistent with where previous administrations have been. In fact, in some areas, it's even improved. Uh, we've been dealing since 2014, of course, with a much more challenging security environment after the Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, the ongoing undeclared war in eastern Ukraine. Uh, so we had to kind of re rebuild and relearn the de uh, deterrence. And the U.S. had to play a very pivotal role in reassuring allies in, the, in these early days after the annexation of Crimea that we weren't going to somehow let the Russians do to us what they did to Ukraine. So uh, we've now seen with Trump in the last year and a half uh, increased spending for a, a program called the European Deterrence Initiative, uh, continued support for deployment of forces in Poland and, ro and ro rotating troops going all over Europe to both stabilize in, in the, you know, the nerves of our allies, but also to deter the Russians from any kind of aggression, direct or indirect. Uh, and I think the U.S. is leading the way in s defining the agenda for this summit of NATO that's scheduled for July of this year, putting increasing emphasis on allies, uh, increasing the readiness of their forces, putting more forces at a high level of, ready high level of readiness so they can reinforce in a crisis. The ability to reinforce is ultimately what will deter the Russians. If they think they can get away with a, with a land grab or some kind of limited incursion uh, without any NATO response, uh, then we're in deep trouble. Uh, so, as I said, you don't always like how Trump expresses himself. He's still obsessed with this 2% of GDP going to defense as a benchmark. Uh, but uh, on the whole, the policies are, are uh, quite good. Thank we you. keep my fingers crossed that he doesn't change his mind. <laughs> uh, we'll come back to this. Um, uh, Nina, I, I'd like to ask you, you're, you work on what, what I, I call the Russian war in our minds. Mm. And, um, so, you know, something, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, why did NATO not discover that this will be, uh, this will be a war on par uh, with uh, the, the, the ideological war uh, during the Cold War? Why, why is it that NATO didn't really get its act together? And don't blame it on NATO. It's the member states. Mm -hmm. Why is it? Why is it that the member states uh, became so complacent? Why is the West so complacent about uh, about uh, uh, resurgent uh, Russia? So I think I would I would f couch that a little bit differently. Um, I, I do blame the member states, of course, but I think this is because of NATO's kind of existential crisis in the post-war era. Um, you know, it's a consensus-based organization, and there's a lack of consensus about what NATO should mean in the post-war era. There's a lack of consensus among member states, and as a result, I think there's a lack of consensus in the minds of the public. Um, you know, just this week, there was uh, a few disinformation stories coming from Russia about seven pilots quitting the German Air Forces uh, because of the NATO campaign against Russia, to which I answer, what campaign exactly? Because there hasn't been one, you know, firmly announced. Um, this is certainly disinformation. Two weeks ago, uh, Russia's foreign minister was saying that the Skripal case, the poisoning of the former spy in, in Britain and his daughter, uh, could be a justification for NATO's military budget increase. Um, so these uh, disinformation pieces take hold, take root in the minds of, of uh, the public because they don't really grasp what NATO is and what it means in the 21st century. And, and uh, NATO member states, I think, need to come to a consensus about why our narrative, our truth, which is the truth, Putin's version of the world is not the truth, right? Why they should believe that as opposed to, uh, as opposed to what Putin's putting out there. Um, and we've failed to do that so far as, as a, uh, an alliance. Are they effective? Putin? Absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, we can look at our country, we can look at, uh, at the past 10 years of history in Central and Eastern Europe, starting from Estonia in 2007. If there were any Estonians in the room right now, they would tell you we warmed not only NATO, but the entire Western structure in 2007 during the Bronze Soldier Crisis, which I view as the beginning of the modern Russian information war, uh, that this was going to be a problem. They've changed uh, our civil discourse and 
you know, we can debate about whether or not they changed any votes in 2016, and I don't think we want to get into that tonight. But uh, the important thing is to note that um, I indeed, they've changed the way that we, we talk about Russia. When in the past 20 years have we talked about Russia so much, or maybe even 30 years? That's, that's their goal in disinformation, to confuse us and to elevate their status. Absolutely, they're effective. Thank you. Um, Heather, 15 years. Look at that years. smile. Uh-oh. <laughs> 15 years ago, 15 years ago, you told me Viktor Orban was the most dangerous politician in Eastern Europe. And I agreed with you, but no one else <laughs> agreed with you and me. And now we're there. Uh, you have a semi-dictator, uh, an authoritarian, uh, heading a country that's a member of NATO. So my question to you, if uh, we were to enlarge with Hungary, Poland, Czech, Slovakia, Croatia today, what would your advice be to your government, the U.S. government, that is the primary stakeholder in NATO? What would you say? Would these countries meet the threshold of uh, the requirements uh, that you have been banging into my head when I was negotiating NATO membership? Um, well, Andres, thank you, and thank you so much. It's, it's great to be with you. Um, I'm going to take a step back. Um, Sandy talked about NATO. The, the military alliance and how important that is for deterrence and defense. But NATO is also a political military alliance. And to be honest with you, for the last 17 years, as we've focused on out-of-area operations in Afghanistan, the alliance has really shrunk its conversation to tactical military operations. How many forces will be supporting ISAF? Uh, how are we doing a train and equip uh, program uh, for uh, Iraqi forces? And we forgot the essence of the alliance, which is that it is a community of values. That's the glue that binds us together, not the number of forces we have, although that's important, not the projection, power projection capabilities, or whether you're nuclear power, not nuclear power, that we are a community of values. I think it's also instructive to think that democ we, we've somehow gotten our, into our heads that democracy is the destination. An election equals democracy equals destination. Democracy is the journey. And our mistake, in my view, uh, in enlarging, enlarging NATO, whether that was in the 1999 wave when we brought in Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, or the 2002-2004 wave, which was the three Baltic states, uh, Slovakia, Slovenia, Romania, Bulgaria, and has since expanded to Albania and Croatia, and we just added Montenegro, so we're now 29 members. That's a big community of values that democracy is a journey and that we never really, uh, we tested members so carefully. I remember in the enlargement round, I visited Latvia five times in one year. We were counting how many citizens were going through that process. We were counting how their anti-corruption activities were happening. It was a rotor rooter <laughs> through uh, their political, it was so intrusive, but we had to be intrusive because Article 5 is a sacred commitment. We have to know exactly if this democracy is worth a U.S. soldier life, because that's in some ways what we're committing. So if you're not committed to those values, we have a bigger problem. And so what we're encountering now, and it's not just NATO, it's also the European Union, but let's talk, we're talking here about NATO. We don't have the policy tools for when a member of our community backslides, decides that elements of democracy are not in keeping with its vision. I think, first and foremost, I think the greatest challenge to NATO right now actually is Turkey. Uh, not only for its ge geostrategic location, the size of its forces, its, its critical uh, role in NATO, that regime unfortunately has been sliding for quite some time. We haven't responded well to that. Hungary, Poland, others, Romania, Slovakia, um, we as a community haven't focused on those values. And it's hard for us now to do that, um, but that's the work that needs to be done. Um, and if I can just 
make a, a, a reference point. If you have not read Senator John McCain's message to the Munich Security Conference this year, I wholeheartedly commend it to you. It, it, it's very emotional. I think we're all uh, in a very emotional place with Senator McCain as um, he nears the end of his life. But in his message, he talks that we in some ways have forgotten our inheritance of the post-World War II generation of this alliance, what makes us special, what makes us unique, and that we have to fight for that every single day. I'm ready to fight for Hungary and fight for Hungarian civil society and democracy, but the Hungarian people have to fight harder. Polish citizens have to fight harder. Turkish citizens have to fight harder. We'll concentrate on the military at the NATO summit, but the biggest gap is that we're not talking about our societies and our democracies, and that, of course, includes the United States as well. I, th I think, I think uh, Poles and Hungarians will get there. They, sudden, they suddenly realize that they have to do the job. Others we can't will, do it for them. Others will not do it for them. So I think we'll get there. It's a very painful uh, thing. But I'd, I'd also like to add that in terms of one thing is, is for sure that I included. Um, I think we all underestimated the length of the transition between com from communism to democracy, mm -hmm. how long it will take. It takes few years to establish a market economy. It takes two generations to establish the mindset of, yeah. of people with a democratic mindset. But, but I, Sandy, I, I, let me take this a step further. Uh, you were, you've been sitting in the NATO Council now, if I add all the years, maybe 10, 12 years, mm -hmm. and watching the decision-making process. Can NATO function at 29? Is the United States still fulfilling the role that I remember when, my, when I first uh, became ambassador to NATO and sitting at the NATO Council? The Portuguese ambassador told me, don't forget there is only one golden sh uh, stakeholder in this company, <laughs> and that's not France. <laughs> and so, and so Sandy, what's your response to that? Yeah, first let me say I agree. Uh, that NATO is a, a political alliance as well as a military alliance. And uh, we do have a dilemma now with the countries that are backsliding because I think we, we became more political with the end of the Cold War when we didn't have to worry so much about mm -hmm. external threats. Uh, it was wars of choice when we went into Bosnia and Kosovo, even Afghanistan to some degree. Uh, the focus was on partnership, not just with other European countries, but with the Middle East, with North Africa, with uh, Korea, Japan, uh, but particularly with enlargement, we really did insist on nations meeting pretty high standards of, of values, democratic reforms, institutions, because uh, we saw this as a sort of a moment of maximum leverage. And NATO kind of paved the way for the EU's ability to enlarge as well. So we, we shouldn't uh, uh, underestimate how important that was. But but, you're, but Heather's right. We didn't build in a mechanism for uh, suspending people's membership or even expelling them, that, that just simply doesn't exist. Uh, so far, you know, neither Hungary nor Poland or even Turkey have kind of blocked the work of the alliance, but the solidarity that comes with the shared values is, is at risk. And uh, unfortunately, the United States doesn't seem to be in a position to exert the moral leadership one would need, uh, which brings me to your second question. Uh, I think, uh, in my experience, and I've served in NATO now on three different occasions. I was the deputy in the early 90s, the ambassador of the late 90s, and I was deputy secretary general up until the end of 2016. The numbers around the table don't matter so much. Number one, uh, because everybody knows NATO is too, sort of too big to fail, too important to fail. So if there's anything important, sooner or later, allies are able to find consensus. Uh, but it does still heavily depend on, on strong and consistent U.S. leadership, but also finesse, not you know, imposing its will, but persuading, being ready to compromise, and, and you know, building a consensus that, that, will, that will hold. Uh, uh, and I think we, we've continued to have that uh, uh, you know, with different styles of, of the ambassadors who've represented NATO and the, and the ministers who conduct the higher level meetings. Uh, I think we're still playing the role that we've played historically that makes NATO work. And you're right, it is, the U.S. is the first among equals. It's not like the EU, and maybe that's an advantage. because 
there's no natural leader in the European Union, and that's why they, sometimes they get paralyzed and uh, get bogged down in interminable bureaucratic struggles. Uh, sometimes it takes uh, the big superpower, the big gorilla in the room to uh, lay down the law. But most, most of the time, it's, it's friendly persuasion, consensus building, a lot of backroom discussions and coffees and breakfasts and things that kind of bring different actors on board. Uh, but I have not, not seen a case where just having too many people around the table makes a difference. It makes the meetings longer because everybody wants to say something, <laughs> and it can be very boring. But, uh, <laughs> but at the end of the day, NATO gets things done. That's why I devoted so much of my life to it. <laughs> I've been the, I've been on the receiving uh, receiving end of uh, U.S. leadership, and uh, you know, We're still not, friends. 90, Ninety-eight percent of the time, it was uh, it was very nice. Uh, we were uh, talking over coffee. Uh, we had some nice conversations. Um, asked very politely. Two percent of the time, when it really mattered, I had these deep uh, icy look looks in my eye, and. Uh, just want you to do it. And I think that's the way to do it. And I think it's important that sometimes the United States just makes clear that this is the way NATO should be moving. Don't have, this is, this is an organization where leadership sometimes is hard, but it's, it's totally necessary. But can I, can I yes, step please. in? But I think, Andres, NATO was built on U.S. leadership. Yep. And this is the, I think sometimes we mm -hmm. forget this. I mean, well. we, can, we can be very frustrated that they're the free riders that uh, the U.S. pays for this, but we built it based on U.S. leadership for purpose yep. to protect the United States and to enhance our security. I like to say it's the ultimate America first policy. These alliance structures were designed to enhance America's economic prosperity and its security. So if the U.S. does not lead it doesn't function very well. It can keep sputtering on, of course it can. But that's what makes US leadership so essential. And when we stop playing that role, or we get tired, or we get frustrated, or we say, you take this, we're busy somewhere else, it does not work. But the American people see it as a burden. As I said, we, we've forgotten our inheritance. It was our gift to lead something that amplified US power. And we have to speak to another generation of this inheritance and what it means in the 21st century. We're lamenting a past and we're not projecting the future for another generation to understand why this matters. I, I totally agree. Nina, mm -hmm. um, your, your topic, uh, how, should, how should NATO deal with that? How, how would you suggest that if you went to see the Deputy Secretary General of NATO and said, listen, listen, I have a big idea for you. How, how would you describe this? You know, why should NATO deal with your stuff? Mm. And how should NATO deal with your stuff? Well, I, I think the first thing is exactly what Heather was just talking about, speaking to a, a new generation about what the inheritance of NATO is, not only on the American field, but, but in Europe as well, because that's where a lot of this disinformation is happening. Um, but after that, you know, I think this is not just about churning out press releases or uh, fact-checking Russian fakes. Um, it's about actual communication and public education, which I think, I actually asked this question at a conference a couple years ago of a NATO official. I said, what are you doing about disinformation? How are you reaching people beyond, you know, the experts in this room? And he said, that's not our job. And that made me very sad because those are those are taxpayer uh, dollars or euros uh, going to fund NATO, and we're going to lose that public will if if we're not communicating that. So I think there needs to be a real public education campaign going on right now. There are some centers of excellence that are sponsored by individual member states and groups of member states that work on issues related to disinformation, like cybersecurity, strategic communications, and hybrid threats. Um, but again, these are only reaching within the expert community and not reaching outside of it. And we, we tend in the West to want to build new centers when it comes to fighting disinformation. And I like to say that fighting disinformation is not like the movie Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will not necessarily come. Um, and that's true whether you're, you're fighting disinformation with a center or fact-checking things. We need to compel people into this narrative. And right now, we've lost them. So that's what I would say. Talk to people. Um, we're, we're all a bunch of wonks in this room, room, but we need to, we need to make it uh, compelling to people again, the way that it was in the post-war era. Um, and part of that is what we were talking about before, that democratic message, which
which uh, it unfortunately has kind of gone by the wayside over the past few years. I would agree. I would agree with that. I often describe what the Russians have been doing you know, to us during our elections, to many European countries, is, is, is a kind of political aggression. So NATO's good at defending against military aggression. We need to make defending against political aggression a central task of the alliance as well. Because we're defending our societies, our values, our democratic institutions. We're not, it's as important as defending our borders, and maybe more so, because the Russians are going to keep doing this, whereas I think we can successfully deter them from on the military front, but they don't seem as easily deterred as long as they can get away with this and maintain plausible deniability. But it's very difficult because when, when, uh, when Mr. Schroeder, the former chancellor of, of Germany, is standing in the first row uh, celebrating the inauguration of Putin next to Medvedev and uh, way ahead of the Pope of the uh, Orthodox Church, uh, that sends the message that perhaps there are some, some allies uh, who like, you know, who like Putin, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot more than they like the American president. Well, and, and not only and that, I would say even sick. more even more concerning is the statement that came from the press secretary yesterday in which she said that the president congratulated Vladimir Putin on his inauguration. Yeah, but, but let me, let um, me, okay, well, you know, I, what I want, but what, what I, I, I really uh, want to say is that uh, there is a big issue out there, and this is energy security. NATO used to deal with pipeline security uh, in the Cold War. It used to deal with energy security. And, and my question is, did NATO spend enough time uh, dealing with uh, energy security? Which, by the way, uh, with the building of Nord Stream 2, if Nord Stream 2 is built, will be a catastrophe. And I think it will have a more uh, dire uh, strategic uh, impact uh, on 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 transatlantic security, because it divides uh, east and west, because of all kind of things, makes Europe more dependent on the Russian gas. I could go on and on. So why has NATO not dealt with these issues, and why has NATO pushed harder? So I, two thoughts, and this gets back to your question of uh, how do you manage a, an alliance of 29 countries? Yeah. And I think, again, in the Cold War, there was a unifying principle for NATO members. It was the existential threat of the Soviet Union. When that lifted, um, everyone has a different interpretation. So you ask all 29 members of NATO, they will tell you very different things about their threat assessment of Russia. The closer you are to Russia, you have a very clear understanding that uh, Russian aggression poses a threat to your national security. If you are in Southern Europe, your threat comes from the South. It comes from migration. It comes from jihadism. It comes from different. And Russia may look like a ally to help solving your Southern problem. So when there is not a common threat assessment, it becomes very difficult. And I agree with Sandy. I think that the alliance has, has mastered that bridging of those different views and not making a choice between defending NATO's eastern flank versus defending NATO's southern flank. But when you don't have a common threat perception, that makes those challenges more real. We know Soviet, now Russian tactics, have always been to exploit and probe weakness. We know that. And this energy uh, uh, you know, needs for Europe are absolutely part of probing that weakness. I don't think this is a NATO responsibility, quite frankly. It is a member responsibility. And uh, yeah, how many wake-up calls do you need? 2006, energy was shut off from Russia through Ukraine. 2009, finally, the European Union, third energy package began. Uh, to, to think about diversification, but we still have Bulgaria uh, as dependent as ever. If a nation cannot make a decision on its own, NATO can't do that. It is vulnerable. But there has to then be strong messages from the alliance that it needs to diversify. This message, both of energy security, goes back 30, 40 years. Remember the friendship pipeline through yeah, Germany? Yeah, 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 My yeah. goodness. Defense spending, we used to say, you need to be 4% of GDP, now we're at 2%. Yeah. These are hardy perennials. And as I said, we are going to keep on having this conversation, but we don't have that commonality of threat. And I think that makes probing divisions, exploiting those weaknesses, it, it something that the Russian playbook can do very well, but it's our fault. It, they're just 
using those weaknesses. Yeah, I think, yeah, we've, honestly, uh, I don't know, if, there is a book called uh, The Sleepwalkers. It's about how the world walked into the First uh, first World War. It's a great book. Christopher Clark, great book. It's a great book. But I am sorry, maybe sh we should be write, writing the second volume, which is The Sleepwalkers of... Uh, yeah, but I, I wouldn't, just wouldn't blame NATO for this one. It's, it's a sort of the political will of, right. of, of nations. Absolutely. And in this case, and it may sound bureaucratic, but one of the challenges for some of these issues like energy security is that we have a European Union that has increasingly expanded its responsibility, and that's a good thing. I think that's beneficial for the United States. And energy security is one of the things where they claim to have the lead. Now, they, they have 22 of the same members, uh, but because ones that aren't in both organizations don't get along, it's very hard for NATO and the EU to do much together. Nevertheless, NATO does sort of raise the consciousness of, of members. We, I, I chaired lots of meetings in my time on energy security with high-level briefers from the EU, from uh, international energy agencies. So it's not like the problem's being ignored, but when we need to actually take, take policy decisions, it's downtown. So, and uh, the NATO ambassadors might urge their counterparts downtown to, to do something, but it doesn't mean they will. Sonny, I'm, I'm not blaming, blaming NATO. Mm. What I'm trying to say is that mm. Uh, the, 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 the Europeans are, are not really paying attention to the long-term impact of, of the energy security situation. And whether they admit it or not, they expect, if, if, there is, if there is trouble, they expect NATO to take care of it. That's not the way it works, and that's not the way it will work. And especially uh, these, these days, it's not, the, not, it's not the way it will work. I have just two questions, and then we'll go to the audience for questions. There is a summit coming. But we, okay, before, so think about, okay, what is your, where is this summit going? What, what kind of summit is this? Is this a, is this going to be an important summit? Is this going to be a blah, blah summit that we have seen uh, a couple of times? Uh, what kind of summit is this going to be? But before that, Sandy, say a few words about yeah. Ukraine. Where do we mess up with Ukraine? <laughs> Which one? Summit or Ukraine? I can do both. <laughs> well, yeah, well, start okay. with Ukraine and then you can go on to the summit. <laughs> Well, on Ukraine, I think, uh, I mean, it shows the, uh, the, the downsides of uh, a country being at risk from Russian aggression and not being a member of NATO, not having the protection that NATO provides. I think NATO sent incoherent signals back in 2008 when there was a summit in Bucharest where the U.S. may be a little prematurely, but nevertheless it, it decided it was going to push for Ukraine and Georgia not to become members, but to get on a membership track, what's called the Membership Action Plan. This was very divisive, and summit was, you know, ended in disarray with a, with a half-baked compromise that actually made matters worse. Uh, a declaration saying that Georgia and Ukraine will be members of NATO one day, but it didn't say when, under what circumstances. And this inspired the Russians to start their war with Georgia, and we saw uh, a few years later the annexation of Crimea when Russia felt threatened by the uh, possibility of a democratic Ukraine turning away from Russia and, and turning towards Europe. Uh, so now we kind of, we're in a hole, but we have to ensure that things don't get worse. I think providing more support to Ukraine, including military support, helping them succeed despite having chunks of their territory occupied by Russia is our, our moral responsibility, but it's also our strategic, it's a strategic imperative. Uh, at the same time, we have to continue to use sanctions and other forms of pressure to try to persuade Putin to at least get out of eastern Ukraine, where there's the act of shooting going on, and reintegrate that part of Ukraine uh, into, the, into the larger country. Uh, but uh, to do that, we need a strong united front among all the members of NATO and the EU, and we need to do more in terms of pressure. The U.S. raised raise the bar on sanctions, but Europe has a tough enough time just maintaining the sanctions that exist. Very hard to get them to do more. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have too many other tools in our toolkit to, uh, to ratchet up the pressure on Russia. But it's, it's, Ukraine is more important than Ukraine itself. Uh, it's about the whole future of the liberal world order. If we let Russia get away with resubjugating neighboring states and kind of drawing a new dividing line across Europe, uh, vetoing the choices that sovereign nations are making. Uh, we're asking for trouble down the road. It would only embolden Putin, uh, possibly even to attack uh, NATO members themselves. 
I can go on on the summit, but maybe somebody else wants to get to go first on that. <laughs> Heather? Well, you know, every summit is an important opportunity when the leaders can gather and push the agenda forward. I, I think, quite frankly, we're all still, uh, we still have our, our little bit of a nervous tick from the uh, last year's NATO leaders meeting where um, Secretary Mattis and others had said, nope, we got this thing. The president's going to reaffirm Article 5 commitments. And the president delivered a very different public message, which was actually a foretaste of a even more difficult private message to leaders just hammering away at this, uh, the question of defense spending. So I think we we enter this summit, I, it is you know being well prepared uh, by very skilled staff that prepare these things. I think the biggest announcements that will come out of it, uh, which have already been sort of pre-announced uh, even yesterday, there'll be two new commands. One will be uh, an Atlantic command. Uh, it looks like it'll be based in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, and that's sort of a, uh, a return, if you will, uh, to the North Atlantic Command. And why? Because we are seeing such a significant uptick in Russian submarine activity in the North Atlantic. Raise your hand if you know what the GI-UK gap is. <laughs> there you are. Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, it's back. Um, and uh, thinking about that, the other command is a logistics command that the Germans will take responsibility for, and that's about rapid mobilization. Uh, again, this is all muscle memory from what we used to know how to do very well during the Cold War when we had 300,000 U.S. forces present in Europe. It was, you know, how do you reinforce presence, keeping those sea lanes open? If there was a crisis in Europe, how would we get U.S. forces there? Well, if you don't control those sea lanes, but even if you do and you arrive in Europe and you have to go across very rapidly to Poland and the Baltic states, right now we we, the NATO has a challenge of sort of rapidly deploying. We're working on military mobilization. Those are important things to strengthen that defense and deterrence on the eastern flank. Um, I think we'll see an announcement. Uh, this is in some ways a nod to the, uh, the Trump administration's view that NATO should be a tool of counterterrorism. I personally don't believe NATO is a very effective tool on counterterrorism, but there'll be an announcement likely on uh, another uh, training of Iraqi forces uh, that NATO will, will constitute. But it, it's pretty thin, but I would argue that thinness is a little bit of concern that I'm not sure this administration and President Trump will effectively make big decisions about NATO. And quite frankly, we're a little concerned that this beautifully laid out agenda summit may be derailed because he will offer new thoughts uh, very spontaneously. So what I want to keep my eye on um, uh, is um, we are now coming up on the 70th anniversary of NATO and of the signing of the Washington Treaty on April 4th. And we assume, uh, hope, think that uh, that summit next year will be maybe in Washington to honor that. And this gets back to, I'm sorry, I'm a broken record here about making sure NATO is relevant for a new generation of Americans. And what I worry about with the president's complete focus on defense spending and thinking that alliances rip us off, this is not... Um, a, a good moment to send a positive message to the next generation, but this could be an incredible summit opportunity to, to help reinforce. I, I personally would like to see a public service announcement that has uh, a U.S. soldier or an airman or a Marine having the T-shirt that says, I am a NATO soldier. That when, when we send a U.S. soldier, that is a NATO soldier. When a Hungarian soldier goes into a country, that is a NATO soldier. We are NATO. We tend to say NATO and us, like we're two separate uh, beasts. No, we're, we're together. How do you do this? So it's, a, it's an opportunity. I hope we can seize it, uh, and I hope we don't uh, misuse it. Perfect. You know, a short comment uh, before we go to sure, the I'll, audience. Sure. If I can jump back to the Ukraine thing really quickly. I want to agree with Sandy, absolutely, that there there's just lacking support on the EU front. Uh, there's there's kind of a Ukraine fatigue that is imperiling not only U U.S. support for Ukraine, EU support for Ukraine, but then what NATO can also provide to Ukraine. And that's, you know, uh, on, on the defense t uh, stage as well as um, we, what we were just talking about uh, as well with, with energy security and Nord Stream 2. 
too. Um, in terms of the summit, I'm looking for Trump and the Trump administration to elucidate not only their Russia policy, but their commitment to American values, which in my view, we have not seen yet. And I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, before we go to the audience, I just want to make one, one comment on, on Ukraine. And now I don't want to sound like a broken record, but <laughs> Nord Stream 2 will result in, this, in, in, in circumventing Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Ukraine will become irrelevant. I was present in the room in Budapest when the Budapest Agreement was signed by Clinton wow. and, and Yeltsin. And I remember every, the, the whole, you know, everyone applauded except for one Ukrainian diplomat who came over to me and said, Andras, there goes our independence. Okay? And I just want to say that once that pipeline is built and Ukraine is circumvented, Ukraine will fall into a black hole and it will be our problem. It will not be the, it will not just be a European problem. It will be an, it will be an overall transatlantic problem if Ukraine falls into that black hole. Yeah. Just a last comment on, on Russia. Russia has a strategy. Strategy is to disrupt the West and it wants to reverse the East. Mm -hmm. And that's really what this whole thing is about. Now I'll stop here and I'll go to the audience. First of all, Should, uh, yes, yes, Sandy. So, some of the people may not understand the Budapest, Budapest oh. 1994 is the Budapest yeah. memorandum when the Ukrainians gave up their nuclear weapons no. and in return for security guarantees, which of course were, were brutally violated when the Russians annexed Crimea. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Yes. Hi, good evening, and thank you to the World First Council to have this opportunity. I wish eventually like this would occur in Paris or in Frankfurt. It never would occur. Anyway, my question is this. Do you think, I don't know which member of the board would like to answer, if Ukraine would have become an independent country and it would become a member of NATO, this definitely would be a threat for Russia. Russia needs the Baltic Sea to access their navy. Therefore, before the Ukraine became, would like to become independent, they decided to move into Ukraine. Uh, do you think if Ukraine ever becomes an independent country, will that ever happen? Um, Sandy? Well, well, sir, with respect, uh, Ukraine is an independent country. It became an independent country in 1991. The problem is the Russians don't accept them as an independent country. Putin even said to, to George W. Bush at the summit in 2008, you know, don't you know, George, it's not even a real country. He considers it part of Russia. Whereas Ukrainians now in increasingly lopsided margins insist that they are culturally, ethnically, historically a different people and they deserve the same sort of independence as any other country in accordance with the UN Charter, the Helsinki Final Act, you, and you, you name it. Uh, but they the do have is, uh, Russian passport. They do have. Well, but the still Soviet the Union broke up consensually. Uh, Pre president Yeltsin, the president of Russia, was the instigator, in fact, but with cooperation from the, the then provincial leaders of Ukraine, Belarus, and others, they agreed to dissolve the Soviet Union and set up independent countries loosely linked through the Commonwealth of Independent States. And uh, just because President Putin thinks that was a mistake doesn't mean he can just sort of unilaterally uh, gobble up part of the territory of his neighbor. Uh, and and send in little green men and deny that they're even there who are waging a continuing war killing Ukrainians every every other day of the week. So the problem is we have a Russia that believes that it has some kind of divine right to dominate its immediate neighborhood. And that, that kind of thinking was supposed to have gone out of fashion in the late 20th century. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, that kind of retrograde thinking is back. And we're still struggling to come up with a, an effective response. But I think at, at a minimum, we have to deter Russia from doing even more of this sort of uh, territorial aggrandizement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, next, the next question, please. Uh, a quick poll for the panel. Should Macedonia be admitted to NATO? Yes. Yes. <laughs> if they, I mean, not that it's the right condition, but it is an established condition. They have to find some solution with Greece on the name of, of the country. Life is unfair, but this is, was agreed by NATO in 2008 as the condition. And that hopefully they can actually make a deal this year. All right. Thank Should you. all the former Soviet republics be called former Soviet Republic of blank? Next question. 
Hi. Uh, thank you for this informative um, forum. My name is Contessa Bourbon from Wall Street Journal and London Times. Can I ask the panelists, um, how should NATO address the current military operations or military strikes of Turkey on its border with Syria against Kurds? Should NATO help Turkey because Turkey is a member of NATO? How should U.S. view these operations as it is supportive of Kurds? So uh, NATO has certainly, uh, well, let's step back. Uh, there is a land command, a NATO land command in Turkey in Izmir. Um, and uh, NATO has provided uh, AWAC coverage and support. Um, but it's been challenging. Uh, German forces uh, have been sent to Turkey, but German parliamentarians were not allowed to visit their forces uh, due to the views of the Turkish government at the time. And Germany moved those forces uh, out of Turkey. Um, and I think I'll, I'll turn to Sandy as well. Turkey, for me, is right now one of the greatest strategic challenges for NATO, for the United States. Uh, not only uh, Turkey's growing uh, relationship with Russia, which, again, continues to potentially divide Turkey from NATO, uh, but in fact, the U.S. has um, in conflict with Turkey on so many fronts. We don't share uh, objectives in Turkey. Uh, we don't share objectives necessarily vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Um, it, it is a it is a great challenge uh, to us. It is it is a, a difficult partner right now. I think we need to both redouble our efforts to try to re-anchor Turkey into the Euro-Atlantic community as it slips not only from NATO but from the European Union, while at the same time we better strengthen our regional relationships in case we find ourselves in a situation where the U.S.-Turkish relationship, the NATO-Turkish relationship continues to, to be in a downward spiral. I'm very concerned as we look to the upcoming June 24th election that we will see um, an acceleration of Turkey's um, anti-democratic methods. And I think that would, again, continue not only to damage Turkey, it would damage transatlantic relations with Turkey. Sandy? I wouldn't add much. I mean, Turkey is, isn't seeking much more NATO support for its operations inside Syria or along the border. It, it does want NATO to continue, continue to provide certain protection with air defense missiles, oh. surface-to-air missiles, and these AWACS flights, these surveillance flights, and, and sharing of intelligence about uh, the terrorist uh, movements and, and threats. Uh, I think the big problem in sort of deconflicting what the U.S. is trying to accomplish and what Turkey is trying to accomplish is really a challenge for the United States as the leader of the coalition, which is not a NATO coalition. It's run from Washington. Um, but f how to do that when you know, our key ally in northern Syria is, is a sort of a, the ultimate enemy of, of the Turks because they see the YPG, the Kurdish uh, militias that have been the mainstay of our ability to defeat ISIS, as an arm of the uh, Kurdish Workers' Party, the PKK. Um, and uh, there's, there's no persuading them that uh, they're different. Right. Well, I just add, uh, if Turkey proceeds with its purchase of the Russian S-400s, I think you'll very likely see Congress uh, seek to impose sanctions on Turkey, which will only uh, increase the challenging bilateral relationship, as well as NATO's relationship uh, yep. with the um, NATO missile defense program. Yes. Yeah, um, my question is directed at Heather. You were talking about alliances, and I would like to hear your opinion about George Washington. I think it was at his farewell address leaving the White House about our <laughs> avoiding entangling alliances. And yes, I am breaking the rules. This is that question. I, anyone is free to go in and say the idea of NATO, first of all, half these countries are nowhere near the Atlantic Ocean. And I believe they were against a now-defunct Warsaw Pact. So isn't this whole thing kind of passe? <laughs> <laughs> well, very quickly, um, I, I don't 
see these types of positive value-based alliances as entanglements. I think entanglements are where you, you, you develop a very complex, conflictual web of, of uh, relationships that can pull you into conflict. I, I see NATO as an alliance built to prevent conflict. Um, so I don't think that's the same as uh, President Washington may have been suggesting. So, so, so you're referring to APEC? Uh, <laughs> Um, as far as, so I'm going to give, uh, and everyone has their different views on the value of NATO enlargement. I am a huge proponent of NATO enlargement. I believe that we should never um, uh, apologize for bringing peace, stability to 100 million people in Central and Eastern Europe. We had a historic window, and that window is now closed, but we moved that line of freedom farther to the east. I think we continue to support Georgia, Ukraine, those countries in the Western Balkans that seek a, a Western uh, liberal-based approach. Um, and we will wait for that next window of opportunity. Someday, I'm such a dreamer, I would like Russia to integrate into that system. Now, that would not be NATO. That would be a different structure. We're just not at that point in history. Um, but I, I know many believe that, uh, and, and Russia helps us uh, with those views to say, we have caused this. This is our fault. This is not our fault. We, uh, we, we need to bring peace and stability uh, to an area, and we want Russia to return to the rules and the treaties that it agreed to the now that has walked away from. We welcome them to come back to that treaty-based uh, 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 European security architecture that they've left. Yeah, as bad as the situation, where, where are you? I can't see you. She's okay, as bad as, as bad as the situation is today in some parts of Eastern Europe, can you imagine how bad it would be without membership in NATO? What a tragic situation we would be facing in Central Eastern Europe and how Russia would take advantage of these countries. So I, I just want to say that the best thing that ever happened to Central Eastern Europe and to the Western liberal order is, uh, is uh, NATO enlargement. Yeah. Uh, do you think that uh, the withdrawal of uh, President Trump's uh, from uh, uh, Iran nuclear uh, deal would affect future decision among NATO uh, NATO's uh, member and uh, would make more division within the NATO? Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Why don't we just take a couple and then we can yeah. answer more. And the please. I, my big fear is uh, a grand bargain in which we uh, chase the Russians out of eastern Ukraine in exchange for a promise mm. that Ukraine will never be a member of NATO. Um, if somebody held a gun to your head and forced you to name a future NATO member after Macedonia, who would you pick? Uh, some possibilities include uh, Ukraine, Georgia, Israel, Moldova, Malta, <laughs> Cyprus, another Scandinavian. Sweden, Sweden, Finland. Sweden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a related question on the Iran uh, agreement that was broken, uh, was violated by uh, President Trump, uh, and that's if um, the Europeans still trade with Iran, and the U.S. then uh, retaliates against European governments. Is, is that actually going to lead to a trade war? Uh, okay. Let, let, okay. We'll we'll answer these questions, and then we still have time for your question. Okay. Um, all right. Who's who wants to start? Sandy. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, okay. Heather. On the. Heather. I mean, I. Sandy. I was saddened by the decision by the president to withdraw from the Iran deal, even if one believes that it had serious flaws. There was plenty of time to continue to work the problem with our allies, with the Russians, with the Chinese, and with the Iranians to come up with a longer-term solution. Nothing would, bad would have happened in the next five years in terms of the verification procedures, which we now are at risk of losing entirely. And uh, Iran can start churning out mass quantities of uh, fissile material uh, you know, starting later this year. So uh, will this, this will be very divisive in the transatlantic community. I'm not sure it will affect NATO as such, an ability of NATO to deal with its own agenda. But it's corrosive to the kind of uh, mutual understanding and respect, because this was done basically in blatant sort of disregard of the, of the concerns of our closest allies who bent over backwards to try to find some way to bridge the gap. 
and this was basically dismissed out of hand. Uh, and as for, uh, I, I share that fear of a grand bargain. Uh, NATO member after Macedonia, I would say, well, Israel's not eligible because it's not a European country. Moldova doesn't seek membership, nor does Cyprus or Malta. So you've got Ukraine, Georgia, and, and if they change their current position, Sweden and Finland, okay. uh, who would be most welcome on, they would be given some kind of fast track membership if they uh, just said the word. <laughs> Um, in terms of the Iran deal, I think it's important to note that I think U.S. credibility is out the window at this point. Um, how many deals has the Trump administration torn up? How, how can uh, we make any deals in the future, whether that's with NATO partners or anyone else, and say in that... Jungle. Yeah, exactly, and say that they're not going to go out the window with the next administration. That's, that's the most important thing to me. Uh, I would agree with what I assume uh, Heather is about to say and what I think Sandy <laughs> just... Uh, in, uh, 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 alluded to, which is that Sweden and Finland are, if tomorrow they decided to join, they would probably be the only uh, countries out of the ones that you named that would be able to, because uh, the rest have a ways to go in terms of reforms on a number of levels. So I, I absolutely, on JCPOA, um, I, I think it's important to note, we've lost bipartisanship in how we approach these deals. We, one administration comes in and does what the last administration does, and then they, and so we have a broader problem. I mean, we can personalize it, and that's fine, but we have lost bipartisanship. If this would have been a Senate-ratified treaty, the president could not have done what he did today. But we don't ratify treaties anymore because we, we don't go through that process. So we have a structural problem here that, of course, erodes um, our credibility. The Europeans tell us uh, that at, with Russia and China, they're going to go forward with this agreement without it. But you're absolutely right. The secondary sanction impact uh, will certainly uh, uh, be a very big problem for European companies that will be trying or thinking about doing business um, in Iran. You add on top of that, if the president decides not to continue to waive steel and aluminum tariffs against the EU as of June the 1st, that's the next double whammy. These are our friends, remember. These are our friends. These are who we turn to on the Security Council and to help defend U.S. strategic interests. So there's a broader challenge. On the grand bargain, my fear level has gone down. Congress has played an extraordinary, as much as I just now, <laughs> you know, sort of dumped on poor Congress for not ratifying treaties, they've actually held the line um, with the grand bargain and, and sanctions. The strength right now, I mean, what President Putin has done by interfering in our election has, has flipped everything on its head. The Democratic Party now is the most anti-Russian party uh, that I've ever seen. Uh, and, and, and where I was hoping there would be engagement and compromise, we need dialogue, nope. And the Republicans are, are well, half of them are very strongly opposed uh, to uh, Russia. Others view this through a political lens. So the problem now is we have a reduced space, even within Congress, to find those creative solutions where we need to try to get back on a sustainable path. So uh, very dangerous. And uh, yes, uh, Sweden and Finland. Uh, but I don't. I don't want to. I don't think Sweden and Finland are anywhere near this decision. And the moment that they, in their public opinion, will want to join NATO, the security environment will have deteriorated to such a point that it's too late. So I'm not sanguine on Sweden and Finland. I'm with you. I'm with you, Heather, on Sweden. By the way, there was good, good news today. Oh, Offsetting a little bit the Iran decision, Sweden and Finland signed a memorandum with the Secretary of Defense Mattis on trilateral defense cooperation, which doesn't affect their position on NATO. In fact, it, it's a, a way of it's an alternative doing team. more without having to address the NATO membership issue. So well, I, it good. won't be on the front page, but it was good news. Yeah. Thank you for telling I, us I, that. I've been, I've been out. I've been, I've been, I've been in Helsinki and Stockholm campaigning <laughs> for NATO membership. And I keep telling them, I mean, you can't stay nine months pregnant with NATO forever. So that's that's my line. But That's sir, a visual. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here tonight and for all the jokes. Uh, <laughs> Great material. Um, so my questions about the African Union, uh, you spoke about values and backsliding. So naturally, my question is, can NATO learn anything from the experience of the African Union? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Question. The African Union. Okay. All right. We'll take several questions again. Well, there is one more question, and we'll, we'll honor that. Oh. You, only, you, you only have a 
half question to go. It's not even a question, it's a, co uh, a comment. Uh, NATO is a stronghold for Europe and it will never go away. I served with NATO. I worked with soldiers from Spain, uh, Germany, Turkey. You will never see a U.S. soldier wearing a NATO T-shirt because you have to understand every country like to retain their individuality as an army, air force, or navy. They work great in camaraderie, and they accomplish the mission, and that's what is important. That's very cool. Thank you. All right. So uh, go ahead. The, the, the question about the African Afri Union. I don't know. That was it to you. We're a little thin on African Union knowledge <laughs> up here. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, but I think that the, one, the one thing I will say, um, and this is where uh, the European Union and thinking about its broader defense role, what we're seeing is a much more uh, focused uh, EU uh, common security and defense policy role in the Sahel, again, with, with US support, um, working with partners. And that's really prior to Ukraine. Um, the U.S. European Command, NATO, was really about partnership capacity, working with those partners to help strengthen. And again, it's not just a military uh, relationship. It's about transmitting those community of values. Uh, I think we will continue to see where unrest from conflict, climate, economic challenges, and th this is really, quite frankly, when you talk to many Europeans, Southern Europeans, they look at the potential for further migration and destabilization as a real national security threat. So I think you'll see a lot more uh, Europe, EU, in Africa for the foreseeable future. Sandy, if anybody yeah. have thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. On the African Union, I know they do have mechanisms for uh, suspending membership of uh, members who are misbehaving. In the NATO case, I, there's no way to introduce those because you have to have a consensus to introduce the rule, and <laughs> you'll never get that. Nobody wants to create a rule that's going to bite them in the rear later. Uh, so it comes down to U.S. leadership, and unfortunately, you know, the values agenda is not being strongly represented by President Trump these days. But nevertheless, you know, the U.S. has a role to play in counseling members as the primus into Paris within the alliance. Also, the Secretary General of NATO has a, a much stronger position than, say, the Secretary General of the United Nations. He, he actually chairs the meetings, has a certain moral authority. And, uh, and this, this current Secretary General has tried, not with tremendous success, but with some success, to go to Turkey frequently to work with the Turks to try to kind of manage the problems and sort of urge uh, sort of a cooling of tensions and sort of compromises on how to diffuse some of the issues that have arisen. So uh, that's why they have increasing preference for former prime ministers who have that kind of political clout and experience to, to, to deal with the recalcitrant members, which kind of goes beyond the, the rules of the organization, but are essential to keep it functioning. And uh, the point about NATO na nations you know, keeping on their own uniforms, I mean, that is of the part of the nature of NATO. It, it is a, a voluntary alliance of sovereign states. You don't pool your sovereignty in NATO the way that nations do in the European Union. Uh, but I think they do put a little, they have, they insig they have a, a, an insignia. They'll have a, U, a U.S. insignia and a NATO insignia. Uh, and uh, there is this effort to brand NATO more, this we are NATO. You know, it's a thing. It's hashtag we are NATO. Try it. <laughs> check, check your Twitter. Check it out. You'll get a lot of interesting things. Uh, NATO does, as Nita said earlier on the discussion, do a better job in projecting why it's still around, what it's for, what it st stands for, as well as what it's doing. I mean, there's a lot of ignorance about that, too. I think this summit will be an opportunity uh, to spotlight some of the things uh, that NATO is doing for deterrence, to stabilize the Middle East, to deal with hybrid warfare and disinformation, hopefully with more resources than they have now. Uh, uh, and hopefully our president will stay on script this time, uh, and it'll be a uh, a joyous occasion rather than <laughs> a, like a trip to the dentist. <laughs> Nina, uh, would you would just want to say some final words? 
Uh, I would just encourage you all to, in the realm of NATO branding, and we are NATO, uh, to continue the lighthearted nature of this event. <laughs> there, there's an interesting video that NATO made with uh, our Estonian partners where it shows, uh, I think, UK, US, and Estonian soldiers like flipping tires and stuff in the, <laughs> in the forest in Estonia. So I encourage you to look at that and think about whether that would convince you <laughs> whether NATO is worth it or not. And that's where I'll end it tonight. Okay. Well, th thank you very much. I I just like to say that I think I think we've been pretty convincing that NATO does have a future. One, two, NATO is still the institution of choice as far as we are concerned, and and I'd also like to uh, like to uh, say that uh, you know uh, NATO you know Trump will be gone a uh, long time ago when NATO will still stand and will be a relevant and important organization, but don't ever forget. The future of NATO starts in Washington, D.C., and you are part of that, and you have to add your voice to uh, support the renewal, the reinvention of NATO, and it has been an honor and a pleasure to chair this meeting with some of my best friends, Sandy, Nina, Heather. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming.